The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com. Empire. Baseball is changing its age-old tune. Uh, but you're absolutely correct. You're, you're kind of asking people to either change up their routine, uh, maybe open up their mindset to growth, or potentially change the way they think and teach um, certain aspects of the swing. That's Justin Goltz, the channel manager at Major League Baseball at Blast Motion, where blasting off like an Astro or National is possible. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. Let's talk about the past for a minute. What the Washington Nationals did to win the World Series, winning four road games against the 107-win team to take the championship, that was a first in any major American sport that involved a seven-game series. Five come-from-behind elimination game comebacks, two against the 106-win team before even getting to Houston. There's no algorithm for the comeback of the ages and the run they went on this past October. Justin Goltz is pretty sure that Houston, as long as they can mentally get over it, will be fine. Part of the Nats' legacy is dealing with the decision to shut down World Series MVP Steven Strasburg. That happened seven years ago. They were hoping to avoid a new injury to his surgically repaired arm. Sam Miller from Proteus Motion updates us on how Tommy John won't mean the same thing, but the season's over for everybody, so time to play some golf. And that's where the future is now. Golfers will use any advantage. Wearables, sightline devices have been purported to help players of all skill levels, but the market on golf balls has been cornered for years by a select few, and you know the names, Titleist, Callaway, etc. That's changing. Mike Crowley from Bloomberg joins us now. Is this the craft beer era of golf balls? Lots of smaller players disrupting this? Uh, I think it is to some degree. I think that's that's an analogy we I used when I pitched the article to the editor that uh, we seem to be in this moment where the internet has sort of, I would say it's leveled the playing field yet, but it's kind of close. You know, as the article talks about, a lot of those companies, uh, they saw an entry point because of what they've seen in other industries, particularly Harry's, uh, Dollar Shave Club, Warby Parker were the names that were mentioned. And those those particular founders felt like, you know, there was a, there was a space in golf balls uh, to do that. And I think that we are starting to see that because the products are they're pretty good you know they're not you know there's there's little to no fall off with many of those uh, golf balls profiled in in the piece so how are they different or superior to what you would buy from the name brands you know i don't know that they'd be that much different if you're not unless you're scratch or better you know if you're if you're a 10 handicap i, I don't know that many 10 handicaps can differentiate between uh, a Titleist Pro V1X and a Titleist Pro V1 for sure. So I don't know that they could differentiate at all between some of those brands. Some could. I mean, I'm kind of a gearhead and, and I'm not a very good player, but I can sort of tell the difference in those products. So I, I think what you see, the difference is, particularly in the in the four companies we profiled, I would say Snell and Encore stand out for their emphasis on technology, which is not to say that Vice and Cut Golf Balls are not using technology, that they don't have engineers. But when you look at Dean Snell particularly, you know, he, he is the developer of the Pro V1. And then he went on to develop the Tour Preferred for TaylorMade. He had 25 years in the golf industry. He's, got, he's on over 40 patents. And he's brought all that knowledge to his own company, which he wants to keep intentionally small. He doesn't want to get, get big. And, you know, his, his R&D, which we were not able to put in the piece, but I think is fascinating, is that for every box of Snell balls you buy, you get a questionnaire. How did it perform with the driver? How did it perform around the greens? What did it feel like with your seven iron? What what is it flying like in the wind? And he's got all these questions, and and then every morning at five he gets up and he reads those, and that's his R and D team, the <laughs> customer, and he goes out and he sort of tweaks the ball based off of this sort of 
feedback that he's gathering from his customer base, which continues to grow because when you look at those independent tests, and even this year they made the Golf Digest cold list, when you look at those independent tests, there is no fall off between it and a Pro V1 or a Pro V1X. I mean, it's right there neck and neck, and in some instances outperforms it. I mean, one of the things, if I'm remembering correctly, one of the things about the Snellball that's pretty interesting is is that its ball speeds at, at a lower swing speed are still very high, which is sort of which is uncommon in, in that sort of what they would call the tour quality uh, golf ball segment. You know, that's an uncommon thing. So there's not really a lot of fall off. And the same for Encore and and, uh, and Vice and uh, Cut. And, and Snell would tell you, like, what you should do is, if you're concerned about fall off, go play – Go play a Pro V1, go play a Callaway, play a Snell or a Cut or whoever, and if you can't tell the difference, then just play the one that's most affordable. doesn't matter if it's my ball or not. <laughs> so I don't think there's a lot of fall-off. Um, you mentioned that they're kind of in the model of Harry's Razors, um, who became yeah. a disruptive force there in the razor industry. Is the strategy to be such a force that Titleist buys them, or are they trying to stay independent? No, I think they all want to remain independent. One thing that Snell wanted to do was he wanted to do, he was in that rat race that Taylor made, and he didn't want to go for big tour contracts. Uh, he told me that he's had tour players approach him. They play the ball, they they love it, they want to use the ball, and then they want you know they want a contract from him. And he goes, "We're not doing that," because <clears throat> he thinks that adds more more uh, price onto the consumer. But he also doesn't want to get that big. He left that he left that world because he was tired of the pace and having tour reps. Encore, I think Encore is not looking to be bought out by anything. I think they're looking to remain independent and sort of build uh, a big brand and, and, and sort of you know find their own way. The other two companies, uh, Vice and Snell, you know what they're really interested in is they're interested in developing lifestyle brands. Uh, Vice says they're not that they're very committed to the golf ball, but you can sort of see how they're moving that they are sort of moving in that direction with uh, apparel and uh, some of their licensing agreements with like the NBA they hinted at another license agreement that's going to come out with a with another major sports uh, 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 sports sports league but I'm not sure who that is wouldn't they wouldn't tell me that so I, I don't think that they really want to be bought out I mean they don't need to be I mean you can make a lot of money in this segment without having to be part of title list or yeah. major Callaway there's there's a lot of room to grow in it, and you can make a pretty healthy profit without sort of being worried about uh, losing customers or leaking customers to those bigger brands. Um, and, and what what how are they going after the average player? Because you mentioned all the str- the scratch golfers, they're going to buy all this stuff, they're going to try all this stuff, and it improves their game. They're going to sure. use it, right? So that that customer's there for them. For someone like myself, I, I watch golf, and I don't know yeah. that I buy a ball because Tiger Woods used it, but I at least know about it because of that reason. So, so how do they sure. go? How do they go about that if they're not going to yeah. get involved with that marketing arm? They're they're pretty aggressive on social media now. Encore has actually sort of gone after some pros, like they signed Gary Player. Uh, or I don't know if they would say that they signed it, but Gary Player plays the Encore ball, and he hit it this year at a ceremonial shot for the Masters. He hit an Encore golf ball. I mean, the camera didn't zoom in on that, but, you know, they're able to tout that. Um, but they're pretty aggressive on social media. The, the vice is really the most aggressive. I mean, you know, as, as social media has changed and become flooded with ads, like you can't get on Instagram. If you play golf, you can't get on Instagram without seeing a vice golf ad. Um, and, and Snell has done that as well. They, they're, they're all using sort of – Snell is using Google Analytics, I think, and Google Ads to sort of target people. And then the big thing is that they're just they're undercutting the price. It's at least a third cheaper. So uh, I think Pro V ones are going for 50, 48 or fifty two bucks now. Uh, you know, you get the uh, same caliber ball from Snell. It's it's thirty three dollars. And that's really what Snell had wanted to do was he thought he would attract people just on price alone. He knew he had a good golf ball, but he was just trying to get people based off that price point. And then when the first uh, independent test came out from my golf spy. Uh, you know, it wasn't just that he beat all the direct-to-consumer brands. He was actually neck and neck with the Pro V1X, and that's when people were like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> and uh, and that really sort of blew up the sales. And then they did a head-to-head with the Pro V1 in March of this year, I think it was, or February, and it outperformed the Pro V1X then, and then his sales went through the roof. And he had to, so he's actually had to go to airship his uh, product in from Korea now, huh. uh, which is not something he had to do before. Um, so there are things like that. So yeah, I mean, I think I think the regular golfer. I mean, 
it's a leap of faith, but, you know, the other thing is, like, a 15 handicap probably loses four balls around. All right? So if you're talking about a Pro V1, I mean, that's, that's, that's 16 bucks you've just lost in addition to your greens fees or whatever. So I think – I think that's where they're trying to sort of come in there. The guy from Cut Golf was very open and honest about it. He was trying to learn how to hit a cut golf shot. I didn't want to lose a lot of golf balls, so he stole a couple from the range one day and was out on the course hitting them, and he couldn't tell the difference. He couldn't tell the difference between what he, you know, the premium ball, as he put it, the premium ball he had in his bag and the range ball he was hitting, and he thought, well, there's a light bulb moment for me because I love to play golf, but I'm not very good. Yeah, listen, I'm guilty of it. I, I see balls on the, uh, you know, lost balls. I take them. So I'm I'm, sure. I'm as guilty of it as anybody. So I get the price yeah. thing. Yeah, so that's, that's a lot of it, you know. And, uh, and they'll also tell you, which the studies have shown, you should never actually play those lost balls, especially if you get one out of a pond. Its properties have changed, and it's not going to perform the same way. So Well... I mean, I'm never going to perform well enough to, to have that matter. <laughs> Mike, Mike Crowley from Bloomberg, thanks so much for joining us. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Take care. Up next, Justin Goltz on building baseball's stars of the future. This is the Future Sport Podcast. Want to really learn how to improve your swing? You could do what the Astros do. Blast Motion can help you with that. Maybe not become Jose Altuve, but improve for sure. Justin Goltz is the channel manager for Major League Baseball at Blast Motion, and he joins us now. Thanks for being here, Justin. Graham, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Um, in essence, what does Blast Motion do? Uh, Blast Motion is an information company. Uh, we manufacture a sensor that tracks. Uh, multiple sports movement. Currently, we focus on baseball, softball, and golf swings uh, and or putts and short game on the golf side uh, to collect data about your swing and then give you information on how to kind of where you stand today and how to improve upon it. Um, let's get into the Major League Baseball one. And I, I want to go through to the golfer one, too, uh, selfishly, because I'd like some help. Um, what does your partnership with Major League Baseball look like? Uh, we had a partnership with Major League Baseball on the marketing front with uh, BAM. So we were able to use the name and likeness of Major League Baseball. Uh, on the back end, there was a lot of accuracy, accuracy testing and um, kind of testing to go through that approval process. Um, uh, separately from our BAM agreement on the marketing side, we've been approved to be used in-game at the minor league level hmm. and for all on-field activities at the major league level, excluding in-game. So pretty much the only place that Blast cannot be used uh, from a rule standpoint is in a major league baseball game on the 40-man roster. Um, but uh, the BAM agreement was great for us, kind of gave us a ton of exposure at a time to set us apart in the marketplace. Uh, and kind of put us on the map in terms of getting the legitimacy, the legitimacy from Major League Baseball. Now, I imagine that some of the holdup with doing it in-game is the tug-of-war between the union and the information and how that's going to be utilized. Um, do, do you expect that in the near future that could change, that Major League Baseball and the players will agree to allow this type of technology to occur in the games? Uh, it's certainly going to be a topic of conversation in the upcoming CBA. Um, there's no doubt about it that data and player information has become more prevalent um, and, and applied and used on a daily basis by both teams and the athletes themselves. So um, it could be a holdup. It may be used in negotiations, but it'll certainly be a topic of conversation nonetheless. Um, in terms of the, the information you are gathering now and then providing back to the athletes, and let's stay in baseball for a moment, what are they learning about themselves by using your equipment? Uh, today we've come a long way since our initial rollout with Major League Baseball teams. So our current products and our current offering within the app and our web services um, give you information about three crucial pillars to the swing, I'll call them. Um, how on plane or your on plane efficiency percentage, which tells you how long you're on the swing plane. Um, your rotational acceleration, which is a byproduct of how well you sequence with like your hips, torso, shoulders, and hands. So rotational acceleration is a big piece of that. And then your connection, which is what's the relationship between the implement you're swinging, in this case, the baseball bat, and more like your postural and body tilt adjustment. 
And then this information then gets filtered down to who? Swing coaches who then try to implement the change to improve performance? Yeah, certainly coaches, head coaches, um, owners of training facilities are, are certainly our champions in that aspect because they have access to so many athletes. Um, you're starting to see a lot of ownership by the individual athletes themselves, um, not only at those facilities, but by Major League Baseball players who use this as a tool for the live feedback sessions. And outside of those playing connection and rotation pillars that we've really um, essentially founded and, and become – uh, have become the staples of what we deliver, you're able to kind of figure out a lot about the swing contextually with things like bat speed and attack angle um, and vertical bat angle and all of these other reference points that can give you a lot of cool information on possibly where contact was made and then how those plane connection rotation metrics change by different pitch locations, contact points, things like that. In terms of implementing it, um, we've talked to a lot of different groups who are in this field in different varieties, different disciplines, different sports. Um, trainers and swing coaches and managers and all that, they've been around for a very long time. You are asking them to change their methodology a little bit based on the information that you are providing to them. Um, Was there kind of a tipping point where they were more accepting of what you were telling them, or or how did that kind of progress? Certainly the the hitting side is a little bit behind the pitching side, so it was kind of nice to follow the footsteps, if you will, of other technologies that had kind of supplanted themselves on the pitching side. Uh, But you're absolutely correct. You're, You're kind of asking people to either change up their routine uh, maybe open up their mindset to growth or potentially change the way they think and teach um, certain aspects of the swing. So that's never really a, an easy hurdle to overcome. Um, but overall, kind of the space that we're in and, and maybe the way of the world as it relates to technology and data is, you know, kind of time and information tells all. So it took us a bit of time to kind of gain traction, see the level of adoption and level of data collection that it took to show those results. Because with our sensor on the bat, um, you're able to then show how that translates to batted ball data. And we have a lot of information on batted ball data and how that translates to on-field results. So if you're able to say, you know, if A, then B, then C with, you know, swing, swing data with bat sensor technology, batted ball data with, you know, ball tracking technology, and then translating that batted ball data to on-field results, um, it certainly took some time, but I think – um, as data correlates itself, uh, it's tough to argue. So um, Major League Baseball adoption and, and the growth there has certainly helped to kind of get that validity at elite levels. And then we're starting to see a, a mass trickle down as it relates to the college, high school, and academy level. Um, you had mentioned it would take some time to get to where you guys are. Can you kind of take me through the evolution of the beginning of the swing analysis to, to where you and Blast Motion are now on it? Absolutely. Um, I think we started with the more contextual um, information that we deliver today in terms of simple things like what was your bat speed at impact and what was the attack angle of the bat um, as you made contact and your vertical bat angle, what was, the, what was the angle of the bat when you made contact. It gives you a lot of good contextual information, but uh, I think a lot of credit deserves to be awarded to Patrick Cherveny, who now works with the Cleveland Indians, who was an employee for ours for a couple of years. And he headed up our R&D department and spent a lot of time. He had a pretty incredible background from his time at Callaway on the golf side. Um, He had spent a lot of time with inertial sensors for uh, club fitting on that front. And he was able to kind of um, dig a little bit deeper and and dig back a couple layers and put together concepts around swing plane, you know, rotational acceleration, connection, and things of that nature uh, that gave us more information about how the hitter was moving uh, to reduce you know, produce results like the, the bat speed, attack angles, vertical bat angles, things of that nature. So, um, again, it, it comes with time. It comes with data collection. I think any metric that you deliver to an end consumer um, not only has to be accurate, but like I said earlier, has to, you know, tangibly show um, on-field results or translate to uh, improved results on the field. So that took some time not only to collect the data, but to tie that data to the batted ball results to say, you know, when I increase my on-plane efficiency, I increase my average exit velocity because I'm barreling more balls. You know, when I um, increase my rotational acceleration, I'm starting to see higher contact rates because I'm sequencing properly and have more time to digest the, the incoming pitch coming towards me and things of that nature. So um, it took a couple of years. I've been at Blast 
you know, three and a half years now. And I'd say at least that first year and a half or two years that I was here, and I was a little bit late to the game as it related to the development of the technology and the people that were here before me. Uh, a lot of time was spent on validating those metrics and uh, making sure that they're not only accurate, but, you know, translated to on-field results at the highest level at Major League Baseball and then starting to see that it duplicate itself down the chain. But you've been there three and a half years. What's your background? Um, my background is I was a three-sport athlete. Um, I, I grew up in Michigan. I played all high school sports, football, basketball, and baseball. Um, I was lucky enough to play all three out here at Occidental College, a small Division three school. Um, so played all three. And then I actually played professional football for five years in the Canadian Football League. Um, after that, kind of hit. Um, I, I got my degree in economics and then minored in kinesiology, so more sports science. So all that's kind of coming into play in the world that we live in now. Um, but kind of hit that, you know, uh, point in time in my playing career where it was time to figure out what that next step might be. And I always tried to be cognizant of that. So um, luckily enough, I had settled with my wife here in San Diego. Um, I worked at Skills for a little bit, you know, helping manufacture some training equipment on the football side. And at the time, Blast was kind of expanding um, its youth the use and rollout in baseball. And we're looking for people to come on board to help with that. So, um, you know, my background definitely as a player helped bring some insight on, you know, how, how to apply the data, uh, but definitely used a lot of resources here and in baseball along the way to gain more information on, on what we could truly do to be uh, where we're at today. Largely what we've talked about to this point is um, improvement for the players themselves, the athletes, whether it's Major League players or younger players, obviously, as well. Um, and Major League Baseball isn't allowing it to be incorporated in-game yet, but maybe eventually they will. Um, would this end up being able to provide content for broadcasters of games? Absolutely. It's, it's been um, done on that front to a certain extent. Part of our uh, Major League Baseball agreement allowed us to collect data and use it for broadcasts um, in the future game. So we did that in 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, so we were capturing data live. We had to make a few adjustments with our solution to get that information uh, to the broadcast booth in real time, but we were able to do it and saw some pretty cool uh, results as it related to you know home runs or um, you know, doubles and extra base hits that were hit during the game and being able to show uh, what the bat speed and attack angle at the time were. We also did the same with the college home run derby uh, in 2016, 2017 um, to give you your bat speed and attack angle in real time. Um, you guys are also um, in competitive softball as well. Same technologies or, or is it different there? Same technology as it relates to the hardware. Uh, we made a few minor adjustments recently with the silicone attachments for some of the smaller softball handles. And then outside of that, all the other adjustments really come in the software. So as that sensor with the same hardware as baseball collects the swing information, uh, we make a few changes to our algorithms to adjust for um, like slappers in softball, um, the ball weights and adjustments as it relates to some of the metrics that are calculated at impact. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, different content and use cases on the softball side for the training regiments. Maybe some of the core principles around the training are the same, but you obviously have some uniqueness to uh, male and female builds and their ability to move and stuff like that. And as of, and for golfers, um, and this is where I'm being selfish because I want to know how I can get some help here. Um, clearly this is something amateurs like myself could use. Can you kind of help me understand what your tech would tell me, let alone a professional about their swing to, to make us better? To date, um, our golf solution has really been used primarily on the putting side. So maybe for novice golfers like yourself or myself, that's where strokes um, add up at the end of the day, even though it might be the most not the most glorious part of our training regiment when we do get to go to the, the driving range. So um, to date, our putting has kind of led the way on the golf product. It gives you your timing tempo, uh, face rotation, lie, loft, and other metrics that maybe tell you why you're in line or out of line with uh, your putting stroke. There's actually a large investment. It, it can track all of your clubs to date with you know some of the similar metrics you see on the baseball side with uh, club head speed, attack angle, um, things like that, uh, and some of the timing metrics around your backstroke and forward stroke. 
Uh, but there's actually a heavy investment, and we look forward to a rollout here shortly, um, possibly by the end of the year, giving you a lot more information on um, you know, live feedback and audible tones in your golf swing, as well as uh, focusing a lot on your short game and your irons. Listen, I'm happy. I'm in the large bucket of people who'd be happy playing bogey golf. So you cut some of those putts down on me. You're my best friend. Yeah, we all would. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll take it. Uh, Justin Goltz is the channel manager of Major League Baseball at Blast Motion. Thanks, Justin. Sam, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Up next, will there be a day that Tommy John surgery isn't quite as serious as it used to be? This is the Future Sport Podcast. So let's take a minute here to thank our friends at 3 Advance. These guys are ranked one of the nation's top app developers, but that's not all. They've helped grow a bunch of sports tech startups like Team Builder, T-Box Tour, and In-Game Fantasy. But they're also experts in user experience, cloud APIs, and artificial intelligence. So if you're looking for a dev partner to bring your future sport tech to life, look these guys up. Go to 3advance.com. They're the team to make it happen. At Advance, you will. That's the number 3advance.com. And tell them Future Sport sent you. A couple of names will end up in the history books for winning a World Series. And hopefully... No one is going to get associated with Tommy John, who has the unfortunate designation as someone named after a specific arm injury. But times have changed, and having Tommy John surgery doesn't have to mean what it used to. Sam Miller is the founder of Boston Biomotion. Hey, Sam, how are you? I'm doing well, Bram. How are you? You know, I think everyone hears the name Tommy John, and why don't we just start with this for those who actually don't know. What is that injury? (laughs) <laughs> what is that injury? Uh, I think it's an injury that uh, really uh, comes down to uh, overload of mechanical stress uh, on uh, the uh, joints and ligaments in the elbow. Uh, and uh, it's specifically a common injury for uh, pitchers um, because the pitching motion haps- happens to be one of the most complex motions if not the most complex motion in the human body uh on top of uh you know uh, throwing at that velocity uh creates this incredible stress on the arm that uh, most human bodies are not able to uh accommodate and so uh this is an injury that uh, is is all too common and it's a it's a major problem for a professional and a pre-professional uh, uh, baseball players. So anyone who follows the sport, especially at the high level, knows what this meant in the past. Besides literal recovery, it, it meant what for the pitcher's ability to actually be able to recapture all the velocity and control. For uh, capturing uh, recapturing velocity and control is usually a very extensive process that uh, requires uh, incredibly uh, intensive rehabilitation with the many risks associated with it and i think it really comes down to uh you know it also increases the risk of re-injury um which is which is a kind of a very common occurrence as well um so this process can take you know anywhere between you know up to 18 months really uh and many players never fully recover um, and actually, just a quick anecdote, one of our partners and investors is former pro pitcher Chris Capuano, uh, played about uh, 17 years professionally, uh, 12 in the big leagues, had you know, two Tommy John surgeries. And you know, one of the things that kind of drew him to what we're doing is uh, he, he tried our technology, you know, which unfortunately happened right after he retired. Um, and it resonated with him so much because of uh, the, the feeling that uh, he was looking for during that recovery process for how to strengthen uh, the structures that support the elbow um, and uh, thought that, you know, which we also agree with, 
that this this you know to developing uh, could be incredibly effective for uh, you know accelerating that process uh, and preventing the re-injury. All right. So, what did you create, and and how does it help this process? Sure. So, uh, generally speaking, I mean, I, I should note first of all that just last week we did change the company name from Boston Biomotion because we are not located in Boston. We are actually in New York City, um, and we uh, we we just changed the name to Proteus Motion. Uh, Proteus is kind of our flagship product, and and what this is is, generally speaking, is a it's a new category of intelligent exercise and rehab equipment that's designed to rapidly strengthen, optimize, and restore sport movement patterns. And the way that this is done, uh, and, and this is best kind of experienced in person, of course, but the, the second best option is to see some of the vis- the, the videos on our website. Um, which you can either go to ProteusMotion.com or BostonBiomotion.com. And this, this involves a combination of two major inventions. And one is that we've developed a new type of strength training that we've patented, and it's called, uh, we call it 3D resistance. And it feels like moving in a fluid. So you could think of, you know, Pool workouts and aquatic training are incredibly popular, uh, specifically for, uh, for for pitchers because it's low strain on the joints but high muscle activation. And uh, this this kind of fluid type of resistance can be adjustable, so it feels like you're moving in mud or oil. Um, and what this does is it creates a greater neuromuscular stimulation, which is obviously critical for coordination and proprioception. And tying the body together, sequencing, you know, sequence of muscles firing to produce the optimal movement patterns. So we have this kind of new resistance uh, uh, modality for strength training. And then that's coupled with the software platform that produces this huge, uh, uh, very in-depth array of, uh, of performance data that tracks progress, looks at, you know, personalized insights and recommendations. And so these two kind of inventions together produce this experience uh, that really hasn't been seen before. And so uh, we see uh, a lot of baseball players specifically using our technology for anything from uh, arm care to traditional rehab into training sport movements in the return to play process. And we found that, you know, using, using the Proteus system to train these movements produces up to three times more muscle stimulation than free weights and cable machines and with significantly lower mechanical stress on the joints and ligaments. Have you seen an increase in recovery time? Uh, We've seen a a decrease in recovery time. Uh, Yes, uh, we have. Now, I should know we've got, you know, 10 plus published studies uh, on, uh, you know, a spectrum of uh, performance data and the relationship of the data associated with Division One baseball players at University of Pacific, on top of uh, muscle activation uh, research done with our partners at the Hospital for Special Surgery, which is quite significant. Uh, most of the uh, you know results that we've seen uh, in the field from players recovering faster has been largely anecdotal. I mean, we've been around uh, for four years in development, but only about 18 months in the field with systems, but it is incredibly compelling. And one example is a player on the, uh, in, in the Bay Area in San Francisco, you know, suffered, you know, uh, uh, a UCL injury, uh, derailed his college career, started using the Proteus system last August, uh, is part of kind of the middle of his Tommy John recovery. Uh, by February, he was, you know, throwing 95 miles an hour, which is his personal best by far. And he, uh, and he got signed uh, with the Oakland A's. Um, this is Grant Goodman. And Forbes did a story on this uh, a couple months ago. Um, so we're seeing this commonly. And I think what, what the, in the longer term and the bigger picture you know, uh, we really believe that this technology is going to not only accelerate those uh, those injury recovery timelines, but help play a significant role in preventing the occurrence of those injuries by being able to strengthen 
movements, uh, whereas traditional strength training equipment is really focused on st strengthening isolated muscles. And that's kind of one of the biggest differences. Um, we've spent some time talking about Tommy John. You, you've talked about it. it's not just for that. It's for, for other injuries as well. Um, what are you seeing success with in terms of the common injuries that we hear about that you're helping with? Sure. I mean, rotator cuff, uh, you know, strains and, and other related injuries is, is kind of a no-brainer um, and a very easy application uh, on the Proteus system. We see a lot of usage um, with, you know, uh, shoulder injuries and, re and uh, recoveries being done on Proteus with great success. Um, we're developing new attachments uh, for the uh, Proteus system that include, you know, hip, core, uh, lower extremity, and a whole suite of other uh, advancements that will kind of enable us to, to perform rehab for you know, ACL injuries and so forth. But right now, uh, the primary applications and success we've seen have really been focused on the upper extremities and the shoulders with tremendous success. Sam, what's your background? What got you interested in this? You know, it's, inter it's an interesting story. I was a multi-sport athlete uh, growing up. I grew up outside of Boston. Um, I had, you know, like, like, like many people in this space, I had a, a athletic career that was derailed by uh, numerous injuries. I had a condition called osteochondritis desiccans, um, which w caused tremendous uh, pain in my knee, but it also made me deeply familiar with the rehabilitation process uh, altogether. And I just remember, you know, as a teenager going into, you know, my, my physical therapy sessions and uh you know they would put me on this big giant machine uh it was kind of called a biodex which is kind of an isokinetic machine and i would sit in a chair and do these leg extensions and i just was incredibly frustrated with this limited equipment that was kind of forcing me to isolate specific muscle groups and there was no translation from what i was doing to my actual sport movement uh and then they'd send me home with a a, uh, a sheet of paper with a bunch of exercises uh -huh. and I have to manually write down what I did. And this whole process is really archaic to me. So fast forward a few, few years, I, I found this, this really exciting opportunity, which was um, uh, to, instead of trying to, cr you know, slap a sensor onto a traditional piece of strength training equipment, like a, a cable machine or a free weight, we are kind of attacking this problem from the other end, which is, trying to reinvent strength training uh, altogether with a new device that produces resistance that, um, you know, reacts and responds to to uh, any conceivable human movement and is kind of adaptive and personalized to your movement. And then that happens to open up this door for uh, the first ever ability to measure strength in 3D space and time. And so I was really inspired by this kind of concept, and I found a solution by uh, taking a, a mechanical concept that my father actually invented at MIT in the early 1990s and, uh, you know, set out to kind of redesign this, deconstruct it, and then focus on the software and the analytics. Um, and that was uh, about four years ago that I started this, and the first kind of Three, two and a half, three years was really developing in stealth mode with some phenomenal collaboration partners like the Hospital for Special Surgery. Sam Miller is the founder of Boston Biomotion, which is now called, remind me of the name, Proteus Motion, is that correct? Proteus Motion, that's correct. Proteus Motion, check it out. Thank you, Sam, appreciate the time. Thanks so much, Bram, appreciate it. That will do it for us this week. As always, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com.